Great, so hey everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Tony Nguyen. I am a big data consultant with AWS, and I'm here to talk to you all about uh, IoT and AI with healthcare. So who here is part of the healthcare sector or healthcare vertical? Great. Who here is interested in getting into it? So what I'm here to tell you is that, I mean, I have a lot of content here to go through. We're going to go pretty quickly, but I'm hoping that by the end of it, I'm going to inspire you to think of new things, to think big, to think of new ways to approach healthcare, because really, Today, healthcare is kind of stagnant. It's kind of stuck in the old way of thinking. And by um, going through some customer examples and some scenarios, I hope to kind of change that mentality. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about, say, what IoT is, the customer examples, uh, and how Alexa and AWS can help customers such as yourselves think big. Um, we're also going to go through Plexi, which is a great scenario where um, an AWS employee uh, develop this great, great solution to help out his autistic son. And then we will go into David Woody's story with the American Heart Association, what they've done with our services as well to really advance what's going on in healthcare. So what exactly is IoT exactly? So who here knows what IoT is? Who here has no idea? Who here has some idea, but it's really fuzzy and Gartner has a weird definition? Great. So the Internet of Things by Gartner is a network of physical objects, blah, blah, blah. You see it right there. This is a kind of, it's, it's correct. It's absolutely correct, but it's kind of stale. It's hard to kind of digest. And it's really, frankly, easier to think about IoT in actual examples and thinking of it in ways that people can actually link up with, can actually associate with. So sensors, wearables, things of that nature. We're getting close to 26 billion connected units by 2020. And the key factors that are you know, part of this is that the cost of fabrication is getting lower and lower. People are getting more and more connected. And the reduced cost of storage and compute, especially in the cloud space, is making these devices even more accessible to the masses. And the economic impact, $11 trillion by 2025. So pretty much every vertical, every domain that you can think of is going to be impacted by this. So the promise of the Internet of Things, right? So people talk about the Internet of Things. People talk about how cool it is, how innovative it is. I mean, I'm talking about it to you right now. But a lot of these are kind of aspiring, hopeful, right? You think about the, these are smarter products. These are going to be, these are going to make you more efficient. These are going to make you amazing. People are going to love you. But the, the reality is that it's actually really hard to do it right. Devices are hard to connect, hard to manage, and things don't really interoperate out of the box as well as you'd like. It's really hard to set up a secure IoT environment, which is exactly why people are concerned about IoT. It's scary, especially if you think about how hard it is to secure one of these, one of these devices. So that's where we come in. So AWS IoT is a service that we provide that basically manages that for you. It takes away that, that hard lift of connecting these billions of devices in a scalable, elastic, and secure manner. And what we do is we take that heavy lift, that undifferentiated heavy load, and what I mean by that is the stuff that you don't really care about, the stuff that is not your use case, not your business case. You're not in the business of creating a scalable architecture that can connect millions of devices. You're not. That's just a means to an end. You're not in the business of making such a network secure. That's just a means to an end. You want it to be secure, but that's not what your business is. So what we do is that we provide that for you so you can focus on what actually matters, which is what you're focusing on, which is making healthcare better. And we do this by going through five sort of verticals that we focus on. So the devices themselves, connecting them, the network behind it. So we support HTTP, um, MQQT, MQTT, and WebSockets currently. We have security with X509. We allow you to hook up to our existing services in AWS, so such, such as uh, DynamoDB, Kinesis, S3. So who here is not familiar with those services? Excellent. So um, basically, for, for those who aren't, uh, for the benefit of those, so DynamoDB is our um, NoSQL store, managed NoSQL store. It's really fast, key value access, really great for that use case. Kinesis is our streaming uh, data as a service, where you can process streaming data in a really efficient way, and there's actually ways you can actually run SQL queries against that streaming data as well with um, Kinesis Analytics. And IoT is actually um, well suited to being hooked up to uh, Kinesis. So that's one thing that you should be looking at if you're looking at using AWS IoT. And S3 is our object store, where you can store 
basically an unlimited, literally unlimited number of files and data that you'd like. And as for the smarts, you can trigger Lambda functions on your IoT, either through Rules Engine or uh, natively. So um, who here is not familiar with Lambda? So Lambda is our serverless compute service. So basically think of um, the traditional way of compute, where you need to have a server to run code on. Right? You need to manage that infrastructure. You need to patch it. You need to care and feed it. But what Lambda allows you to do is basically upload that snippet of code, that chunk of code that you've written, to the service. It will run it for you, and it will spit back the output. So you don't have to worry about the infrastructure at all. Your code will be run. And customers today are connecting physical things to the cloud in basically any way you can think of today across many different verticals. Now, I could go into huge detail about each one of these, but we're all here to talk about healthcare. So let me just go ahead and talk about some use cases there. So Philips, who here is familiar with Philips? They're basically a huge device company, right? And the thing about Philips is that they're actually transitioning over to, from that sort of very device-focused world to one where they can actually have actionable insights into data, such as in healthcare. So for instance, MRI machines, right? Those are very hard to upkeep and maintain. And what the Philips Health Suite does, hooked up with AWS IoT does, is it allows them to monitor these, these machines, and not just MRI machines, and basically any sort of device that you can think of, they have hooked up to IoT to give metrics, monitor it, um, to, to collect all this data, and then analyze it in a way that they can actually perform actions on the data. So one big problem with collecting data is that people collect all this data, they, but they, they silo it, right? They don't actually do anything with it. It's one thing to say that you're collecting data, but it's, one thing, it's another thing entirely to actually do things with it. So Philips is, is really doing great things in this space. Emory is another great uh, story where um, they're focusing on identifying markers for healthy aging. And by, by association, trying to figure out what are the biomarkers that have someone tend towards Alzheimer's disease? Those sorts of things are, are really, really hard to actually capture unless you have sensors and wearables on people all the time. And then if you do do that, how do you collect that data in a secure and scalable manner? So that's what Emory is doing today, where they do things like um, jawbones and all sorts of other devices on people in the study so they can collect all this data and then um, at the end of, say, a particular study, they're able to come to conclusions around what the data is and say, is this a valid marker? Is this not a valid marker? You continue on from there. So they're doing really, really cool stuff there as well. So I threw a lot at you just now, but it's really hard, in my opinion, to kind of conceptualize it to something that, that really you can kind of imagine, right? It's, it's, you can say to yourself, oh, that's, that's really great what they're doing, but I, I don't really see how that applies to me. So um, it's, to me, it's often easier to go back and look at the Echo devices as an example of what you can do with IoT. So who here is familiar with the Echo devices? Great. Um, so I have one right here. So you can say things like, OK, Alexa, uh, I feel sick. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Try having a cup of tea or taking a nap. Right. I hope you feel better soon. But that's not very helpful to, to many patients out there, right? So this is where you guys can come in. You guys can think of ways to make this better. And people are actually already going into this sort of space. Speech understanding is getting better and better. These devices, I mean, five, 10 years ago, you wouldn't think of such a device being able to understand speech in this way, being able to understand your intent. Back in the day, you would have to be very precise with how you said things, and even then, it wouldn't be completely accurate. But it's getting better and better. So this is a really great time to get into the space. And this, the number of skills and things you can do with these devices is growing. But we're really here to talk about healthcare. So let's talk about healthcare, right? So how can Alexa help? So let's talk about particular skills in general. So I told Alexa that I feel sick. And so Alexa kind of has lowest utility there, right? It's not that great. What you really want Alexa to do, or any sort of device that interacts with humans, okay, is <laughs> to, to have a sort of dialogue with a person, to have a, a means of interaction that is really beneficial rather than just a simple Q&A. It's low-hanging fruit, don't get me wrong. It's, it's really, really great to get into the space by, say, creating an FAQ bot 
we're creating a bot that says, okay, wh what, are, what insurance providers um, are, are, va are valid for my provider? Um, but th that doesn't really get you too far. What you want to go towards is that high utility. Ohio Health, uh, they presented back in reInvent 2016. They have a great, great story around this. So Ohio Health is uh, a nationally renowned a healthcare system based in Columbus, Ohio. And what they've done is um, they actually worked with us during the beta phases of a lot of our AI services. And they actually have done a lot of great work by trying to enhance healthcare in this way. So a lot of people probably can't see this, but what this is is a cardio workflow where a physician or a PCP or what have you can go through this flow chart and assess whether or not a patient is at risk for um, some sort of cardio uh, symptoms, right? I mean, some cardio uh, conditions. So you can abstract this out to any sort of flow chart you can think of, not just cardio, right? Let's say you're going through um, a call center and you want to route calls through some automated system and you don't want to waste time with actual humans doing very, very common calls. What you can do is route calls through this sort of flow chart. Now, this is all very abstract, right? So I need, it, it's a lot easier if I just you know, demonstrate it to you. So let me go ahead. Alexa, start Ohio Health Helper. Welcome to the Ohio Health Alexa skill. I feel sick. Do you have a fever? Yes. Is your temperature over 103? Yes. Based on your symptoms, I think you should go to an urgent care. Can I assist you in finding a nearby urgent care? Please, yes. Say yes or no to answer Whoops. the question. <laughs> yes, sure. The nearest Ohio health urgent cares are Dublin Urgent Care, wait time, one minute, drive time, nine minutes, Hilliard Urgent Care, wait time, five minutes, drive time, 24 minutes, Grandview Urgent Care, wait time, 11 minutes, drive time, 10 minutes. Are those sites acceptable? Yes. But for the sake of time, that's, you get the idea, right? Where a lot of things just happened there. It wasn't just a simple question, answer, Alexa, give me an answer response. Alexa actually interacted with me as, say, a supposed patient and was able to glean that I was in need of urgent care. More so than, say, going through the entire flow chart, Alexa was able to jump out of the flow and say, this person needs urgent care. Let me direct them to an urgent care center. Let me also call upon Ohio Health's APIs to figure out where the nearest urgent care center is to their location. So a lot of cool stuff. So how about Alexa without an echo, right? A lot of people are concerned that, okay, that's really cool what you just showed me, but I'm kind of bound to this sort of device right now where I do have to buy 100, 1,000 echoes. So let me go ahead and show you what you can actually do. Can you go ahead and switch to the first right there? Go ahead and blow it up. So who here knows about uh, Big Mouth Billy Bass? That, that fish that, you, that basically you push a button and it starts singing at you. <laughs> so um, can you go ahead and hit play, please, and blow it up? What's the weather? <laughs> so, so it's a bit of a silly example, but you, it kind of, if you think about it, there's a whole realm of possibilities you can do because the actual, echo, the actual echo brains, Alexa, is not bound to just the echo devices. You can actually use the Alexa skill service to skill kit to actually abstract out from these devices and get the brains of Alexa out into whatever you want. Uh, various devices, cars, what have you, fish. And you can just think about what you can do with it. Raspberry Pis, phones, cars. So really, think about what you can do with these devices. Think about the different ways you can do things. Because to just think about Alexa crammed to this one thing is you know, cool, but it's limited, right? Think about what you can do. So the Alexa skills kit lets you abstract that out into other devices and other things. And you can see that AWS IoT is at the center of it all, where it allows you to manage those, all those connections for you and manage it securely in a scalable and elastic manner. Now, 
that's really, really great. But a lot of customers also ask, how can you get me these services, these, these, these really, really cool things, but kind of pop them out. I don't need the whole Alexa experience. I don't need all of that. I just need specific chunks. So what we did was we actually um, split this out. We, we heard your feedback, and we created the suite of services that we consider the, AD, the Amazon AI um, service suite, where we bring these sorts of AI uh, functionalities to users. And so the first one of these is Amazon Recognition. So who's heard of Recognition? So Recognition is a really cool service that lets you analyze uh, images and spits back labels, allows you to do facial recognition, allows you to do all sorts of cool things. And basically what you do is you say throw in an image of a person and you get labels back. So you can see um, over there, it's, it might be a little hard to see, but it gives out labels such as car, outside, uh, it's a female, they're smiling, sunglasses, things of that nature. And it's really easy to use. You can send a whole bunch of images at it. It's in basically near real time. It's continually improving, and it's really cheap to use. Now, a bunch of use cases um, that you can think of, let's think of a very simple one that's not exactly healthcare, but what, what customers are doing today. So who, who here watches C-SPAN? It's DC. Who here watches C-SPAN? I'm not surprised. So, um, <laughs> uh, but, but seriously, c is actually a really, really great um, channel to watch because a, a lot of cool stuff happens out of it even if it might be dry at times. But what um, recognition allows uh, C-SPAN to do is, uh, in the old days, someone would have to sit there in front of a desk, in front of a terminal, and identify who's speaking on screen at every given point. And that's a really big waste of time, right? Why not use recognition to identify which congressperson, which representative is speaking on the screen at the given point, and then just display the name? Because you know their faces, they're all public. So that's actually what they do. And it's, you know, you can think of really, really cool things around that. Because let's say, let's, go, let's take it a step further. So Facebook is um, uh, giving out this, or having this sort of experimental pilot where you can talk uh, directly to your representative and it will notify you um, whenever they're speaking on the floor. And what, uh, but, but the issue with it is that it doesn't really exactly pinpoint um, the, at least to my last knowledge, it doesn't exactly pinpoint exactly when the person you care about is on the screen. So what you could do is hook up recognition to that same sort of service and figure out, okay, my representative is up there today. Right now, let me go ahead and send them a message saying how I feel about a certain topic. So let's talk about healthcare, right? So you could do things like set up a kiosk and have, a, say, a person walk up to the kiosk and figure out, are they happy, are they sad, are they in pain? Um, what's their demographics? What's their age? Things of that nature. Lots of cool things you can think of. And it doesn't just uh, stick to images as well. Because think of, say, video. Video is pretty much just a set of still images, right? So what you could do is sample an image, I mean, a video stream, say, every two, three, five seconds, process it, and figure out, OK, how have the labels changed in my, in my stream? And what this allows you to do is figure out things like, OK, let's go ahead and take the facial recognition component of recognition and determine, OK, is this person supposed to be in this space? Is this person supposed to be in this supposedly a secure space, let's say the NICU in a hospital? Are they supposed to be in there? If not, if they're not in a you know, allowed list of people, you send out an alert. Think of those kind of cool things. Poly is our text-to-speech service where you essentially send it a string of text, say the temperature in Washington is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It's processed by Poly, and you get back a response. Uh, it's an audio stream. And what, what you end up with is an MP3. And you can replay it as many times as you want. It comes back really quick, and it's fully managed. And to my recollection, I believe there are 42 voices in more than 20 languages. So you can really play around with this service to get what you want. Um, so, for instance, going back to the Alexa example, the Echoed example, some people only want that poly service. So that's what we have provided. So Amazon Lex, who, hears about, who, who here has heard about Amazon Lex? So Amazon Lex is basically the brains of what's inside Alexa. It's, um, it's essentially uh, a service that allows you to um, interact with bots. So, it's comprised of a natural, uh, a natural language understanding unit, as well as an automatic speech recognition unit. 
And essentially what you can do, very similar to what you do with Alexa today, is you can send it um, a verbal message, what's the weather forecast? And then Alexa will respond with a call to a Lambda function, so any sort of arbitrary code that you want to run based on it. And then you can have, say, that arbitrary code return back an answer, saying it will be sunny in 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, one thing to note is that you don't have to just submit speech, not, not like these guys, right? It's speech only. Lex can also interact with text. So what you can do is actually type in what's the weather forecast and get back a response. And we actually have integration with, um, who here uses Slack or Facebook Messenger? We have interaction with those services. So you can actually create a bot that can interact with your, uh, say, target demographics. Um, say, where is my nearest hospital? Where is my nearest urgent care center? Into those bots, and they will return an answer for you. And it's really cool. We also have enterprise connectors with, say, Salesforce and such. So if you're interested in that sort of space, you can also absolutely play around with that as well. Fully managed, multi-steps, it's really cool. So here's an example here on the top left where that sort of interaction is on a phone. So I like to book a hotel, and you're typing it. You're not just talking. You're, you're typing it, and then the bot will reply which city. You go through that sort of interaction, and it will book it for you and reserve appropriately. So let's go back to Ohio Health, because I think their story is really, really great. So can you go ahead and play the video? Uh, other one. The Yes, go ahead and play it. So Ohio Health has um, a mobile application that they've created that is, is what they've created to, to have outreach to their, to their user base. Say, I want to um, schedule an appointment with my PCP, things of that nature. And we're going to go ahead and go through it. Sorry to hear that. Do you have a fever? No. Are you experiencing pain? No. Are you experiencing nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea? No. Based on your symptoms, I think you should schedule an appointment with your doctor. Would you like me to schedule an appointment with your primary care provider in your profile, Dr. Jones? Yes. Okay. Based on your calendar availability and your scheduling preferences, I have scheduled an appointment with Dr. Jones for next Tuesday at 3 p.m. So what's important to see here is that that sort of integration with, say, native mobile apps is really, really cool. So here's a more sort of complex workflow. Go ahead. Is your temperature above 103 degrees Fahrenheit? Yes. Based on your symptoms, I think you should go to an urgent care. Can I assist you in finding an urgent care? Yes. I've got some nearby virtual care centers that don't urgent care. So I think this is really cool because you can see here you have that integration with your Maps application. You can call an Uber if you wanted, and you basically get a one-tap stop to getting to the closest urgent care. So go ahead and pause, please. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to show the whole thing. If you want to see the whole thing, please, please take a look at Ohio Health's presentation during reInvent 2016. It's really cool. So let's go ahead and take a look back at this high utility, low utility graph. If there's one thing I want all of you to take away from this presentation, please, please, it's really easy to go towards the low utility to say, please, leadership, and get you know, those quick wins. But you want to do high utility, because that's what really matters. That's what's going to get people interested in what you have to offer, get people onto your platform. So in closing, let me go ahead and just show you Plexi, which is what one Amazon employee did to, and they leveraged Amazon Lex and Alexa to, to create this really, really great product for his son. So go ahead and play it. Hi, it's Roy Larson. Yeah. 
then what are you doing? If, uh, okay, so you can answer these questions. But when it comes to spontaneous, that's when people, as he is growing into adulthood over the next several years, services may not be as abundant uh, or and as, as we might need. And so how do we help him transition to adulthood? Potentially even to be able to live somewhat semi-independently without having to have constant uh, physical supervision. For Calvin, the challenges of living independently are primarily around his own personal care and safety. So things that we take for granted like brushing your teeth then showering and going to the bathroom, those are things that Calvin won't do unless he's prompted. When he's at school or he's at home, we can tell him to do something and then he'll follow through with that instruction. One of the challenges with autism is every child is different. There's things that they get and there's things that other ones don't get. And so you, you're always trying to find that one key to unlock that understanding. Verbal interaction has always been his, his key. So voice was the, was the technology that we were waiting for to really um, build a tool that might be able to help with Calvin's communication. When Polly and Lex were announced, it was actually a, a system where we could actually build communication on the fly. So the first time I'd used the technology, I did not have Plexi yet, it was just playing with Polly. I, I had my laptop and, and we kind of hid around the corner of his bedroom and I had Polly say, Calvin, it's time to go potty. Let's take a break and go potty. And we waited a, a few seconds and all of a sudden his door opened and he walked out, quizzically looked at us like, what are you, what are you doing here? What time is it? It's time to... At that point, I knew, yes, this could be something that we could definitely leverage because he understands that voice. The idea behind Plexi is to build a system that is aware of a person's specific physical need and is built around the ability to prompt them to give them that quality of life, that sense of confidence where they can function almost independently, and it's invisible, it's not intrusive. Yeah. Tell Plexi with Brian, tell Calvin, Come downstairs. There was a problem with the request skills. It's a pause. Tell Plexi with Brian, tell Calvin come downstairs. One of my concerns with this project was that we're trying to, to automate parenting with Calvin. And that's not the case. The, the idea here is to give him a, a sense of freedom in the same way that we all want that sense of freedom. We don't walk into our kids' bedrooms every five minutes checking on them and telling them what to do. And the idea here is to give him that respect of, of privacy and, and keep his stress level down. Okay, now brush your teeth. And it was cool because there was no physical person in the room. There was no face. There was no someone tapping him on the shoulder. It was an invisible voice that he responded to. And that's very chilling to think about in that you're wanting to have a conversation with him all the time. And when you're able to find something that can communicate with him and that he can understand, your brain just starts wondering, how else can we use this? So pretty inspiring, right? So please, if, if anything else, if nothing else, think big.
Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce David Woody to the stage. He is from the American Heart Association, and he's going to show you how they've been advancing their mission on Alexa and Amazon Lex. Is this on? Everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thanks, Tony. That was great. That was a fantastic video. And everything that Tony articulated around natural language, bots, AI, is uh, stuff that we're trying to get involved with at the American Heart Association. How many folks in here are with nonprofits? Anybody? Oh, wow. And healthcare providers uh, as well. So I hope some of this resonates, gives context, even if it's not exactly maybe a use case for your organization. I think it'll be pretty easy to translate what we're trying to do into um, any organization. So we're the American Heart Association. We're trying to advance our mission on the Alexa and the Lex platforms. Um, this is our mission statement. It's pretty simple, very straightforward to build healthier lives free of cardiovascular diseases and stroke. But there's a lot of work packed into a simple mission statement like that. It's pretty obvious. Um, lots of things go into trying to advance that mission. And uh, to do that, you know, a little bit about what we are and who we do. So, so since 1949, we've funded over $4 billion in research around cardiovascular disease and stroke. Uh, we were founded in 1924, and we have over 22 million volunteers, so a very, very, very large scope. So that's how do we reach our audience, how do we communicate our information around all that research. We also have, for example, ECC trains more than 18 million people a year. That's our emergency cardiovascular um, system that teaches CPR. We have advocacies that, that lobby to get CPR taught in schools. All these kind of things are very, very, very large missions, part of the mission, and, and very big scale to try to implement. So that really takes us to this. It's like, how are we using the Amazon Alexa and Lex platforms to advance our mission and all the things that go into that? The research that we fund, the information from that research to our audience, all the services we, we uh, have for individuals and all the information we have to share. So we really boiled it down to two strategic points, and everything's emanating from these, and that's the ease of access to relevant AHA information, number one, and number two, this idea of frictionless engagement uh, with the organization. So all the things we do, all the ways our volunteers, those 22 million volunteers, interact from the, uh, so that frictionless engagement has become a very, very big part of our strategy. And we think that the Poly and the Lex and the Alexa platforms, the AI behind those, Lambda, all these great things, is really, really going to help with those two uh, strategies. So we've got a skill out on Alexa. We built this last uh, De December, and it's, it's, it's still burgeoning. You know, we launched a skill. We've got warning signs of a heart attack, warning signs of stroke, and our CPR uh, functions represented out there. I'll play a little bit of that. I Welcome guess to the American Heart Association. Heart disease and stroke are the leading causes of death in the world. To hear about life-saving advice from the experts at the American Heart Association, you can say, warning signs of a heart attack, warning signs of a stroke, or learn CPR. Now what can I help you with? Learn CPR. Here are instructions for doing CPR on teens or adults, according to the experts at the American Heart Association. If someone suddenly collapses and is not responsive and breathing normally, the first thing you should do is call 911. Next, push hard and fast in the center of the chest at the rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. An easy way to remember this rate is to push to the beat of the classic disco song Staying Alive. Here is how fast you should push on the chest. What? All right, so you get that. So that's similar to what we saw with some of the Ohio Health. And I know everybody, the question in everybody's mind is, why aren't we here and staying alive right there, right? <laughs> working on it, working on it. The licensing problem, Barry Gibbs involved. It's, it's complicated. Um, but why is this so important to us? Okay, so you can see it there, and maybe some of y'all read this slide. You know, 350,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests happen annually. And out of those, nearly 70% occur in the home. 
So who else is in the home? Alexa's in the home. So our thought is, you know, can we move these voice-activated interactive devices with real uh, information in life-saving situations closer to the incidents that they happen? You know, it'd be great to have Alexa call 911. That's something we think about. It's come up, uh, not just us, a lot of folks, but uh, the 911 network is very complicated. There's a lot of logistics around that. I know AWS is working. But, but you can see the potential there. You saw it in the Ohio Health demo. Um, to take via natural language uh, information to the person experiencing the, the issue, whatever it may be, on whatever device they're on in their home. So a lot of promise around that. So moving on to Lex, we're doing a lot around Lex. We're trying to really, really, really crack this nut um, to think about how can we, and, and I think John, uh, Tony touched on it a second ago, how can we take the experience out of a device-specific uh, situation? What if you don't have an Echo? Um, so we want to get more and more into the Lex technology, make it more web-based, and make it less device-specific. So our idea is to really create a 360 degree, degree view of our information and services. Um, probably a similar goal that a lot of organizations have, but, but as our volunteers come to us, they may come to us through a mobile device, they may come to us through a, uh, an Echo device, they may come to us just through a native website. How can we bring all the components of the AHA, which are vast, there's science, there's fundraising, there's healthy living that we're trying, there's, there's our core mission, our community services, advocacy, all these different things under an umbrella organization like ours, and how can we make that a single experience for our volunteers, our stakeholders, such that that wealth of information can be brought up through a natural interface? That's our goal. We've got three proof of concepts going with AWS right now. One is for what we call our NEC, our National Engagement Center, our call center. So they are, they're handling about 250,000 calls a year, pretty high volume, and everything literally from my donation didn't process, I want information on this, to we've had our representatives at RNC have people call and say, I'm having a heart attack, what do I do? So vast range of, of information. So the, the obvious case there is your sort of standard FAQ call center app of can we offload some of the more common questions and, and that a human being spending a lot of time dealing with to a bot, quicker uh, turn time for the caller, and then the folks working on the call center can actually spend more time working on the more complicated issues. Um, Heart.org is our sort of flagship website, a lot of content under that. How do we bring that information uh, quicker and easier access to uh, people visiting that site? And I asked about the, uh, the nonprofit earlier because Y'all understand the fundraising component, how important that is in any nonprofit. It's a big, big part of every mission because you have to have the funds to drive the mission. So those are our three areas of focus. Um, the first POC we did is around our HeartWalk events. They're our biggest flagship events, 300 and something of those a year annually, and it raises you know, $130 million, roughly $1.6 billion since inception. So a big part of that $4 billion that we fund for research is coming from this event and others like it. Um, so we looked at our current approach in terms of registration. So we decided we're gonna start with registration. That's the gateway, right? It's not frictionless. People go through six steps. Maybe some of y'all uh, have similar events and it's, it's very manual process. So traditional optimization efforts, you know, that used to be the way you go and you do some web optimization and things like that, and that doesn't really get to the heart of the matter. Um, I told a story at another summit I was at back at uh, University of Texas where I went to school. Any Longhorns in the crowd? There's usually at least one. I guess that's me. Ah, there you go. I got one. Okay, so uh, entry-level classes at UT are these cattle call classes. Horrible experience, just massive, massive classes. And I had a professor later on who's, I think he's head of AI there now, taught one of these. And he was so frustrated, I remember talking to him, that the students would come and they say, I don't understand the assignment. And long story short, he would just take the assignment, the paper, and just read it back to them verbatim. You know, no special inflection, no, just, just would read it back as it was written, and they'd go, oh, now I get it. 
And it drove him crazy because he's like, I didn't add any content. I just, it was just the act of reading it back to them that, that I got it. So we, the conversation turned to, he was going to create this floating head in a bubble that would just read the assignments out to the students. That was his vision. Well, it was very prophetic because that's kind of what we're at, natural language, all these things. And it, it really started thinking that, you know, if you, if you think about that friction of that, that need to read the question, you know, consume the information in the question or the, whatever the text is, um, process that in your head, figure out what they're asking you, then select an answer and then on, on the web type that. And those are all friction points. So if we remove a lot of those, yes, you still have to comprehend the question. But just like him reading back the assignment to the students, much, much quicker comprehension, much less friction in that, in that interaction. So that's just sort of where we're starting with. And uh, that's where we got into the voice activated bot technology around Heartwalk. Um, I'll skip over that. This is a little bit of the architecture. You know, Lambda is sort of the secret sauce. Here, Tony mentioned that. I don't know how much uh, folks are working in Lambda, but that's where we can use the Lex as the interface, do that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction with whoever's working on the website. And then it goes back to Lambda, and you can have any code back there with any sort of workflows. Uh, that's where you can send it off via API to your third parties like we do with our fundraising software. So Lambda is the secret sauce in this and, and, and writing any number of code in that. And, and that makes Lex just your, sort of your interface. It could be vocal, it could be text. And then CloudWatch is another thing you can put on there to, uh, to get metrics on all of those. Um, so that, you know, just for the sake of time, didn't do a bunch of live demos, but this is our HeartWalk registration bot. You go out to the site, it's there if you want it. It comes up, um, you have your interaction, be, you know, by natural language or, or you could type if you want. And I skipped to this, the important thing on this for us, it's pretty straightforward, but at the end, the fact that, that the, the person registering gets a summary of everything they said through the uh, interaction. They get the chance to opt in, which is something we have to have with our legal department. And if they want to correct something, they can do that as well. So that workflow takes a manual registration process for, of five minutes or whatever it may be for the end user down to just a few seconds, all just spoken command. Although I will tell you all one thing that I've noticed, and maybe a lot of people aren't talking about this, and this is something to keep in mind if, if you're interested in this. Anyone venture to guess what the most difficult thing we've it, bumped into with trying to do this natural language process with some sort of registration? Yeah. Not names. Email address, which just happens to be the most critical data point you could possibly try to be crafting. And why? So I've been thinking about this. Why is it? so hard for email address. It's because everything in front of the at, there's no natural language rules for that. We have years of basically enforcing, no, there's no grammatical rules, there's no natural language, there's nothing, no context for the bot to catch on to. You know, if you decide to make your email address zazzypants at gmail.com, it could be Z-A-Z-Z-Y, Z-A-Z-Z-I, P-A-N-T-Z, I mean, We've, we've sort of encouraged that over the years, right? I mean, email address is a form of self-expression. Passwords, we enforce rules. Email address, we don't. So the bot's trying to figure out what Zazzy Pants is and how it's spelled. It has no context to do that. So somebody's going to need to figure that out because it's a problem. Um, and my email address is not Zazzy Pants at Gmail. Because I just thought of it, right? It might have been. It's probably taken already by now. Um, but that's a real problem that you'll bump into if you try to do any sort of registration. So the second POC we've got is Healthy for Good is a big program for us to encourage um, you know, better living, better health in general overall, no particular focus except for you know, eat, eat smart, add color to your diet, and move more, et cetera, and something to do with stacked rocks. I'm not sure what that's all about. But, um, so uh, working with AWS, they have developed a prototype of a tracking bot. And I think this will play. If not, I will play it myself. I've edited this down for time, but it'll give you an idea of this. Say phrases like, I ate two cups of apples today, or I walked for 30 minutes today. 
I ate two cups of apples today. Thanks. I will record that May 14th, 2017 you consume two cups of fruit. Okay? Yes. Great job. Data stored. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'll, I think you get the idea. But, the, you know, the idea here is we can put that natural language bot on a, on a page. You could hook IoT devices up to the back end of this, depending on what you want to track. And then the user can just talk to their phone, update their thing, go back to their business. And, and, and maybe they're at work, so they want to update what they had for lunch in our context of healthy living. Maybe when they get home, they want to update that as well. So this is really, really something. There was a great blog, um, Bob Strahan, Oliver Atoa, and Bob uh, Potterveld, who was talking on this right there. Uh, wrote a blog that just came out last Friday, and I don't have the URL, but if you go to the AWS site and look at blogs under AI, I think they just posted it, and it goes through this whole tracking bot architecture and process that they've done. It's really, really, really well done. So we're working on this. That's our second POC. And then our third is just a general FAQ bot. You know, we want to, like I said before, work on that with our NEC, our engagement center, and heart.org. Um, <clears throat> So it's, in, in a sense, a general FAQ bot, but they've come up with some really interesting architecture around this where they're using Elasticsearch um, and S3 so we can put some objects out there and search them, do some different things, and then by using response cards, which I'll show a little bit here in a second, we can bring back more than just text. You could bring back graphics. You could bring back, um, I don't know about video, maybe, you know, no? okay. I mean, I'm just making that up, right? Yeah, and it'll have video and all this kind of stuff. And they're like shaking it. No, no, no. But anyway, you can see where that's going. It's, it, it's the idea that like instead of just bringing back a textual response, you could bring back a graphic response. So you know, to explain that, this is this is our heart.org site. And if I came out here and said I want information on the warning signs of a heart attack, as a user, I mean, do I search on conditions? Do I type in a search right off the bat? And this is common web navigation issues, I know. What do I do? Well, even if I do do a search, you know, we have a good search in, uh, engine, it brings back the appropriate response, but I still have to click on another site and go down and find the information to get. So our idea is, well, what if I could just type that in at the top level of my entire website, no, no matter how deep that content is in heart.org, there I've got my response back, relevant to my question, no navigation, and it actually could be a natural language process as well. And then we took it one step further. Down on that page where these warning signs of a heart attack live, there's some really great graphics that somebody in our graphics department created. Well, why don't we just bring those back instead of bringing back all that textual data that has to be read or a combination of both? So these things start to accelerate as you get into them, and one idea leads to another, and one leads to another. So those are the three areas we're working on. Um, very similar to what we saw of the, of the vision that AWS has for Poly, Lex, and Alexa. And we're going to keep moving in this space, and I'm sure some of you all are interested as well. Those are the issues you'll run into, email address, watch out for that. And thank you very much. Oh, okay. Sure. So we're going, ahead and we're going to go ahead and take uh, some questions now. Um, anybody? Sure. Go ahead. David, your email problem is, is uh, purely because you're web-based, right? Um, yeah, there's no, yeah, I see what you're saying, that if it was some sort of system or device, they could just grab it from an account or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, you should be connected. You have an email address that you hooked into service, you know. Yeah. There's, there's 20 different ways to skin that cat. I just want to yeah, if, if, if someone had an account where we could grab that information. Contact. But, yeah, but if we're just going through just a casual interface, you're right, you know, that's where it comes. But in the situation where we had, in the registration situation, they haven't, si they haven't signed in yet. That, you know, we're getting them to create an account, so it's kind of a chicken and an egg for us. There. But it's on their computer, and you can just leverage it. Well, it could be, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good idea. 
So both of your solutions rely on a one-to-one -one ratio of device to user, um, because that's how you're identifying basic biometrics, you're identifying a provider, you're identifying um, who's in fact donating, things like this. So I'm wondering how you guys are solving for multiple uses situations, um, transference across different devices, some other stuff too, but that's good enough, yeah? Sure, there's, so there's a whole bunch of different ways you can kind of skin that one. Do you want to go ahead and take that? Or? No, go ahead. Okay, sure. So um, essentially, what you can think of is um, it's not necessarily one-to-one -one all the time. So in the case of, say, having a device being a kiosk, you can have people walk up to it, give information, and it's a one-to-many sort of relationship. Now, when you're talking about, say, devices that are personally registered to somebody, or say to a family, and you want to figure out, okay, who's talking to me? There's a couple of ways that people have been thinking about trying to figure out who is talking to the device, which, which is what you're asking, right? So there are some approaches, such as, say, putting a pin in, or um, some other approaches, say, some sort of unique identifier. Um, and the more you think about it, the more ideas you can come up with. So I, I do encourage people to think about the different ways you can do this. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said or support. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that's something that uh, the product team is thinking about, but I'm not uh, clear on an uh, exact date. Excuse me, um, my question around right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you have shown the Ohio Health use case, and yes. you have a providers and Hudson Care are all across uh, different disciplines, mm -hmm. and also uh, possibility connecting with Uber. Do you have that uh, provider list already as a service in the AWS platform, or are you just showing an example? So that's so. You mean the connectivity to Uber itself? Right, so, so all the so providers across the nation that if you want to connect to your web service, do I have the list that can uh, actually integrate that with our applications? Of say rideshare services? When you uh, say pro service? Provider, provider contacts and provider list. So no, by so Ohio Health did a lot of work to, to get that working. Health um, contacts basically, right, yeah. Right. So, so we don't provide those sorts of say contact details as a service now. Oh, okay, so we're just showing as an example. Right. Oh, okay. So I have a question about resource management. Yes. So um, in the field I work in, we have we work with a lot of people in low bandwidth environments. So integrating something like Alexa would be fantastic for people who have the ability to connect to things like that. So, but we still have to manage and maintain other more traditional ways of interacting with our services. Sure. So can you speak a little bit to the how you've managed the challenge of developing this really neat new system of interaction, especially mm -hmm. with AHA, and how you're maintaining more traditional methods? Because I can see the developers in my organization like, no, I want to work on that. Um, <laughs> and um, having a challenge of maintaining our current system and improving that as well. Sure. Yeah. So, so you asked explicitly about AHA, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, no, it's a great point. I mean, to a degree, I think it has to start, and this is a, a, another issue with a sort of a bimodal approach to your IT department, such that you're setting clear roles on what's innovation or R&D or whatever you want to call it and what those traditional operational uh, functions are. So we've done that to a degree. I think it's still a little heavier on the operational side than the R&D side for obvious reasons. But I think that's probably the first thing to help with that. Otherwise, it seems like, well, you know, I'm going to, to your point, I'm, I'm going to work on that. Or you, or, or you legitimately don't just have developers jumping over and say, I want to work on that. There's some sort of organizational impulse to say, oh, we've got to dedicate all our time to this. So that would be my best advice at this point, to try to really structure it where the roles are clear and you've got the resources working on this stuff and you're not doing it at the expense of your operational stuff. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question here. Um, first of all, the presentation was very good. Uh, this seems to be, a, is there a potential for uh, people to actually come up with a lot of apps around using this technology and put it in the marketplace so that actually people can, the way we use apps these days, mm -hmm. is that a potential? So that's actually really interesting. Um, I'm not entirely 
sure exactly how what, what the marketplace team's approach is currently towards these sorts of services and trying to bundle them together. But it's actually a really great data point. I, I can see people like like to your point, you know, bundling these sorts of solutions out as, you know, a really, really great products for people to just consume and then just selling in a marketplace. So yeah, no, that's a, that's definitely it's great, Amazon. Great point. They'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have a marketplace. I have a question about uh, is Amazon at all looking at providing the ability for, if I'm an Alexa user, to give my uh, username, uh, email, and maybe even my credit card, and then when I'm interacting with different apps, it can then transfer that information directly to that app, rather than sure. having to figure it all out for all of us? So for an Alexa device, um, there, there is uh, device data that's associated with your account. So you could pull that data. Now, credit card information I'm not so sure about, but I could see some sort of mapping where you could associate device ID with, say, personal contact information that you can pull. But um, I mean, we can definitely talk offline or you know, after this to, to talk more about your use case for that. Go ahead. <laughs> So, so currently, Lex is not HIPAA compliant. It's on the roadmap for that service. Unfortunately, I don't have a timeline for that. But um, a lot of, see, as you, as you saw, a lot of healthcare providers and um, organizations are using Lex today. So it's not necessarily that you can't start using Lex and if it's not HIPAA compliant, you can just think about ways until that, that point comes. Thank you.